This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. Imagine coming into work one day and being told your company is moving location, that you've got a new boss, or even you're going to be doing a completely different job from the one you did the previous week. Well, in a modern business environment, that's happening all too frequently. And yet, despite the importance of adaption and change for company survival, it's almost as if you can hear the collective groan within a company as those on the shop floor ask, are the top management team changing yet again? certainly the failure rate of organisational change remains alarmingly high. As a result, increasing attention is being directed to identify factors that make change work as it's passed from the top of the pyramid down to those who've got to implement it. Alana Rafferty is a senior lecturer in the School of Organisation and Management at the Australian School of Business. So, Alana, what, what do we actually mean by change? Generally, when we're talking about change, people often think of the larger scale changes, uh, mergers, downsizing, redundancies, you know, all those kind of changes that have a massive impact on our well-being and, and we might become anxious and fearful about. Uh, but I think one of the important things to recognise is that organisations and people in organisations experience a lot of smaller type changes on an everyday basis and those changes can actually have a big impact as well. So, you know, getting a new boss, uh, having a, a job enlargement or a job uh, reduction in scope, for example, um, all those kind of changes are also what we talk about when we study organisational change. No, but why do people get apprehensive about it? In some cases, change may just be a new logo or a new location. Sure, people are doing the same job. Yeah, a new uh, logo, for example, has big ramifications for people's identity. I think one of the interesting things about change is that organisations want us to commit to a company. And a part of committing that to that company is committing to their current identity. Uh, and, and we get a picture of us in that organisation as it is. And so when we engage in changes like changing logos, we're actually asking people to shift how they think about themselves in that company. And so even seemingly small changes can have massive unanticipated consequences, like getting us to change how we relate to an organisation. And what is a major influence here in terms of how people deal with the change? Is it how well people get on with the job, whether they actually care about the job yep. or the workers uh, th that they work with? I think there's a large scale range of consequences that we need to think about. So it, it is certainly performance and organisations are often only concerned with performance. But something I think is really important that organisations need to think about is also wellbeing and people's uh, how they feel about being at work because that translates into outside life as well, uh, how you feel about your family, how you treat your family, how they treat you, uh, also physical health, job attitude. So there's a whole range of consequences that um, we need to manage when dealing with organisational change. And so how do we deal with that to organisational change? You say the top management team come in and they decide, all right, we're going to be doing this certain thing. Yeah. How should they be presenting it to the people who've actually got to implement that change? Um, well, the people who are actually implementing change are often the the lower level supervisors, so people who are on the coalface, so to speak. And so it's really important that there's really clear communication, I think, between the strategic management team, the, the senior leadership, and also the supervisory leaders. And so, you know, you need to be clear as a supervisor, well, why are we doing this change? Uh, what does it mean for myself and my team? Because you then need to communicate that really clearly and realistically to the, the everyday employees that you work with. And yet those employees may be, for want of a better word, cynical about it. They may have seen it all before and it's yet another change from the top management team that's just being imposed on them. How do you get away from that? Absolutely, yeah. Cynicism, I think, is a real challenge in organisational changes. And some of my own research actually suggests that people's past change history in an organisation, how they feel they've been treated in the past in previous changes has a really important impact on attitudes like cynicism and commitment to change. And so the history of our experience of change in our organisation has big consequences for the future. So if you get something wrong today in change management, that has big impacts. And what are the easy ways, if you like, that people do get it wrong, the basic mistakes people make? Yeah, probably the most common mistake is under-communicating. Um, a fear of thinking, if I say the truth, if I say a hard truth, 
that people are going to become anxious and scared and resentful and angry, whereas in fact research actually suggests it's better to tell the hard truth and let people into the, the secret uh, because ultimately they react better to knowing that knowledge as opposed to uh, times when they don't know anything and that's when we get rumours, gossip, um, real scare, scared kind of people in organisations. And certainly I've worked for an organisation once where a uh, uh, big organisational change, people were bit, uh, moved around to various different locations uh, and uh, HR were discussing it, saying if people didn't like it they'd be redeployed to the workforce rather than basically coming out with the truth and saying if you don't like it, well, that's, that's it, yeah. you're out. So should people actually be told the hard truth? Should, after all, people turn up, they, they do the job, they pay the money and they're told if you don't like it, lump it. People should absolutely be told the hard truth because if they're not told the hard truth, they'll probably come up with something worse through sharing rumours, for you know, trying to get some information. And so actually the hard truth might be better than what they'll come up with themselves. And so I think it's really important to recognise that, yes, more communication is better even when it's not something that you feel uh, that people will want to hear. And how about feedback as well? Does that have a place to play where the middle management should actually be listening to the people who are implementing that change? Absolutely. There's a, a lot of recent thinking suggesting that people actually resist change or are cynical because they see problems with how change is going to be implemented. And actually, they want to contribute positively by going, wait a minute, that's not going to work. And so it's really important, I think, that managers and, and organisations recognise that the people doing the work actually have a really uh, valuable insight into when things may or may not work. And so a lot of what we call resistance is actually constructive criticism trying to actually make change work properly. So, so it's not being negative if the workers say it's not actually going to work at all. Yeah. It's maybe they've got a much better idea uh, of uh, how it's going to be implemented. So how should the top management team then actually be listening to that feedback? Well I think it's a real challenge. It's, it's a balance between identifying those kind of comments and that feedback that is constructive and that is designed to say wait a minute that's really not going to work and here's what we should do you know, versus those cases where people might just be uh, resisting or feel negative towards change because maybe they've had bad experience in the past. And so it's not an easy task, but I think it's important to recognise that sometimes people actually have legitimate points to make and are not just resisting for the sake of going, it's too hard, I don't want to change. And in your research, you must have obviously talked to a large number of companies that have been undergoing change. Have there been any that have really stood out for you for being really successful, that have managed to make it work? Uh, I think what we found works well, it's not just relying on formal change, one type of formal change. For example, some recent research I did in the Philippines on a merger, the organisation relied on um, formal communication sessions and they identified two information sessions and that was pretty much their entire change management strategy. Yes, uh, you can already see that that probably is not going to be comprehensive enough. And so it's important, for example, when managing communication issues to think about managing formal communication, but also trying to manage and provide informal communication to your employees on an ongoing basis. So don't just think one time kind of approach is going to work. Uh, change is a process and therefore we need to be continually managing and communicating and refining our strategy in order to make change a success. And in fact, that's almost a classic management technique of deciding amongst themselves, amongst the top management team as to what's going to happen and then just making one or two announcements about it. Mm. But should they actually be then discussing with, with their middle managers and talk about it before they've made any decisions? And that may be seen in some cultures as a sign of weakness. Yeah, the issue of culture is an interesting one. Uh, I think increasingly globalisation means that we have to be very careful about making blanket statements. In terms of organisational change, obviously national cultures uh, will influence how we actually communicate. Um, but I think most cultures, people want continual, ongoing information and updates. And we've also got to recognise in the workplace that it is a very sociable place. Most people get on really well with their boss as well. So there is that problem sometimes actually sticking up their hand and saying, Sorry, I know it's not going to work, but how do I tell you when I can get on with you really well? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we've developed social relationships with people in the workplace and, you know, that can be an impediment to change in that we, you know, we don't, as you say, you want to put your hand up and go, sorry, boss, um, the approach you've outlined is never going to work and I don't like it. And so we have all these complexities in that we're trying to maintain positive working relationships during times of change. Uh, but often we, we really have to, you know, balance the maintaining the relationship plus 
trying to make constructive comments about change. But of course, even though the workplace is very sociable, many workers are actually aware that uh, they're going to be judged by their KPIs, by the appraisal system mm -hmm. at the end of the year when they've been implementing that change. And people will, of course, be getting very nervous about it because they know they're dependent on that job for income. Mm -hmm. So how do people actually deal with that, knowing that it's got to be good, even if they don't, don't want to actually speak out about it and they don't actually believe in the change? Yeah, and again, I think this is what, one of the difficulties of organisational change. You know, we're all in a very difficult position where ultimately we, we have to implement these changes in order to, as you say, perform and, and get paid and, and have job security. And so, you know, I think this is another point for thinking about strategic leadership of organisational change, having enough mechanisms, formal mechanisms, where people can actually have a say in how change is implemented and what will happen. And by doing this, organisations are actually using all the tacit knowledge and the expertise that exists in an organisation. And so we're, we're not thinking that we know everything before we go into a change, we're actually using the expertise that we have. And I understand that uh, you, you've also come across really positive experiences to change of organisations that have done it really well. Yeah, uh, I think uh, organisations that I've seen do the simple things well. And so, for example, in this particular organisation, the organisation went out and consulted with um, gangs of road workers and, and actually got their perspectives on what needed to change and, and how change should be in, introduced in that particular company. And, and for me, that was a really encouraging and positive kind of approach to change and provided a really unique perspective and, and some unique knowledge about how to manage change for different groups of employees in that organisation. Uh, and what was the impact for that organisation? Was the change implemented better and, and did people feel engaged? Absolutely. I think what we learned from that is that there's no one one size approach that fits all organisations and all employees. And so, you know, I think it's really important to recognise when you work with different groups of employees, you might need to do things slightly differently. So, so they really need to tailor it in terms of, OK, you've got totally different people who may be yeah. working out on a road as to those yeah. people who are working in the head office. Exactly. The same approach won't work for both groups of people. They're not facing the same challenges. They don't work in the same environment. Um, they have different educational backgrounds and interests, and therefore we need to take account of those different backgrounds when thinking about implementing change successfully. So communicate, listen to what your people have to say, and also try and recognise that you have a big impact as a top manager in people's attitudes to change, their uncertainty about change, and ultimately how people adjust to change. Alana, thank you very much. You're welcome. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.